Isaac Watts, a great hymn writer. Uh, if you, I, I as a pianist have played tons of his music, so I, I know him. You, you probably know him. Um, he was born uh, July the 17th, 1674. Uh, he had some very interesting gifts as a young man. Uh, by the age of four years old, he learned Latin. Huh? Oh, it gets worse. Uh, by the age of nine, he mastered Greek. You feeling good? Uh, by, by the age of 13, he mastered Hebrew. Where was he from? Unbelievable. Uh, I, I, just, I was reading about his life going, that, that is just, because I've studied those languages. It's like, you've got to be kidding me. Um, uh, he was also an amazing student of the Bible, a powerful Bible teacher, power, powerful preacher. Uh, but he had the gift of rhyme. He, could, he, he was really good at creating really tricky little rhymes. This is, a, this is an acrostic that he put together when he was seven years old, based on his name, Isaac Watts. He's seven. The I stands for I am vile, polluted lump of earth. Wouldn't you like your seven-year-old to understand that? <laughs> S, so I've continued ever since my birth. A, uh, although Jehovah grace doth daily give me. A, uh, as sure this monster Satan will deceive me. C, come therefore, Lord, from Satan's claws and relieve me. Wouldn't you love your seven-year-old praying this? Lord, save me from myself. Uh, there's more. Uh, last name, Watts. W stands for wash me in thy blood, O Christ. A, and, and grace divine in part. T, then search and try the corners of my heart. Uh, second T, that I and all things may be fit to do. S, service to thee and thy praise to. Is that not just shocking or is it just me? He was seven. And I could see a seminary student maybe coming up with that. But uh, I mean, that is just absolutely amazing. Uh, he had a very uh, uh, soft heart, uh, sensitive to his own sin. Uh, and had a really deep, intimate walk with God. So by the time he passed into God's presence, uh, he had written the most hymns of any person in human history. 800 hymns he had written. I'll, I'll, I'll give some to you in case you don't know Isaac Watts. Uh, he wrote, Alas, and did my Savior bleed. He wrote the, my dad's favorite song, At the Cross. Uh, oh, bless the Lord, my, oh, my soul. He wrote that. He wrote, We're marching to Zion. Uh, then he wrote this really great song, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Do you see what I mean? You know, and I was studying all, I was reading all the, as many of the 800 as I could. Um, I couldn't share them all with you for obvious reasons. You're probably thanking God that I'm not. Um, but I just pulled out the ones that it's like, he wrote all of those. So I just kind of wrote in my margin for myself, Lord, might I have a heart that overflows in worship like that. Isn't that a prayer for Christmas? That your heart would overflow in worship that... It just, the worship just comes out. And maybe you can't write songs and maybe you don't know music, but you can listen to music and maybe have a heart overflowing to God. But uh, in his lifetime, he took up on the task, a joyous task of um, imitating the Psalms of David that we've been studying, the Psalter. Uh, and he, in 1719, he published a book called The Psalms of David Imitated. So what he did is he went through the Psalms and he tried to write his own Psalms that reflected the theological content of those Davidic Psalms. Amazing, huh? Uh, here was one of the, after he read Psalm 89, Psalm 89 uh, was a, a psalm uh, about, uh, and it is a psalm, about God's hope for his people that live in very uh, dark, decadent days, politically speaking, spiritually speaking. Uh, and that psalm, if you read it, and I won't read it this morning, you can go home and, um, and read it yourself and, and look at it. Uh, that psalm paints the black picture for Israel. Uh, the, the nation is in sin, their enemies are encroaching. And, 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 and in Psalm 89, the psalmist tells them, uh, have hope. Because great joy is coming because, but because the Lord is going to return. So in light of that particular uh, uh, psalm, uh, Watts wrote these words. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And he wanted to make sure you really understood that last part there. And heaven and heaven nature sing. He said, you know, when he, he reads Psalm 89, he's like, man, I live in dark, decadent days. Because I went back too and I studied the, you know, the mid-1600s, early 1700s, like what was going on geopolitically in his life? You know, the things that they faced back then and the wars, etc. cetera. Uh, same kind of things going on back then, same kind of sins that we see now. Uh, and he looked at that and said, but there's great joy because at the end of that Psalm, the Lord says, I'm coming back to set things straight. And that's the message for today. So why should you be joyous as a Christian? Well, same thing. It could be a really short, concise sermon, Right? The Lord's coming back. We should be joyous. Amen. And we're done. That would blow your minds if that ever happened, but it's not going to happen. So, 
So it, his, his analysis of Psalm 89 uh, leads to that question, why should we, as a Christian, uh, ha- why should we have great joy this Christmas season? So um, <laughs> there's, there's, three, there's three images that he gives you here of Christ based around the names of Christ. I really thought I was going to be able to cover all three of them, but I realized my limitations. I think Glenn Eastwood said once that a man must know his limitations. It's not in the Bible, but it's true, correct? Uh, And so I realize my limitations, so I'm only going to cover two of the points that he brings up in his song as to why Christians should be joyous. Um, Number one, he says you should be joyous in verse one because, as as I would surmise, Jesus is the Lord. He's not a Lord. It's not indefinite. He's not one of many Lords. He is the Lord par excellence. Uh, and based on that, he says in verse 1, joy to the Lord, uh, world. Why? He says, well, the Lord has come. Uh, and then what's the response when people understand who the Lord is? Well, he tells you. What's the response? See the cause effect? What's the response? Well, let there receive your king. If you realize Jesus is the Lord, well, then you should receive him as king. So from the very beginning of uh, Jesus' life, he was called Lord. Lord. Capital L, small, small O-R-D. Lord. Um, that particular word in the Greek text is, uh, is kurios. Uh, That particular word is not an ordinary word because uh, it's not saying he's a Lord like a master of a slave. No, he's the Lord, like divine in nature. Because that particular word, kurios, uh, in the Greek text for Lord, uh, is the word that they would use for the name uh, Yahweh in the Old Testament, the name that they would never pronounce, the tetragrammaton of God that came from uh, Exodus chapter 3 when Moses wanted to know the name of God. And he he tells him, well, tell him, I am sent you. This is the name that we would not pronounce. So if you read it in the Hebrew text, uh, like in Exodus 3, the, the scribes wouldn't put the vowel points uh, for Yahweh's name because it was too holy to say. So they would substitute the vowels for Adonai, Lord. So to, to make the statement that the Lord has come is quite the statement because you're saying that Jesus isn't just an ordinary Lord. He's the Lord of, of the divine nature. Uh, the Old Testament uh, clearly taught, if you study the Old Testament, the concept of Lord, that there was only one Lord. Uh, Isaiah chapter 44, here's what the prophet says. So, Thus says the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, the King uh, of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. God says, I am the first, I am the last, and there is no God besides me. So how many gods are there well we must ex- accept all of them because we don't want to be judgmental for other deity systems that people believe in it's only nice and loving to accept them is that true no that's not true love tells the truth what's the truth there's only one lord there's only one god that's what it says um isaiah chapter 45 uh, god speaking says pretty clear i am the lord this is the l-o-r-d and the hebrew text is yahweh uh, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me. So God says, if you want to know who I am, let me tell you, I am the Yahweh, the covenant, great covenant God. Uh, and uh, other than me, you don't have any other options. All other gods are false. So when Christ comes along and, and, and takes this statement upon himself, because it is given to him, um, as we're going to see, uh, it, it is quite the shocking statement, theologically speaking, because you're saying, uh, well, the Lord is one, but Jesus is Lord. So if God says in the Old Testament, there, I'm the only Lord and I'm the only Lord God, when Jesus comes along and claims deity, as will the angels claim deity for Christ, uh, he's equating himself as the second member of the Holy Trinity. So the, the, the Shema of Israel, Deuteronomy 6, 4, Behold, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Uh, God is one. Uh, the Hebrew word achad means one, like in, there's one of me. But it can also be, mean one in complexity. So when you think about the Trinity, don't you think it's complex? Yeah, because God is one, but he's unified in that oneness. So he's one what and three who's. I know it's early. I'll say it again. He's one what and three who's. What are you talking about? What? I got to put my coffee down. What did he just say? God is what? He's divine, correct? And he's three who's. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are united in one because he is one in his complexity. And just as a side note, not that it's my sermon, but who greater to create the cosmos than a God who claims to be one, unified in one, but I can't wrap my finite mind around his oneness. That's God. Anyway, back to my sermon. That was extra. I wasn't even in my notes. I just, I went off. I did go on a rabbit trail. I apologize. Uh, but sometimes God sends you things. And you're like, I, I just got to talk about that for a minute. So do you forgive me? Thank you for being forgiving. It's a Christian thing. 
Uh, so when you think about uh, Jesus as Lord coming as a second member of the Trinity uh, to teach the people, there's a greatness about the, the character of God and the formation of the Godhead. Uh, here's what we read in, read in Luke chapter 2. Uh, it says, and an angel of the Lord, Kyrios, uh, suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord, Kyrios, shone around them, and they were terribly frightened, as you would be as a shepherd. You're just doing your thing. You're out on the, the rolling hills of Bethlehem. You're guarding your, your sheep that are, as I told you last week, those were the sheep specifically designed for a sacrifice at the temple. That's the kind of sheep that they were. Never have you had a night shift where a, where a, a glorious angel appeared before you and it was blinding light. And, and so when it says that they, that they were afraid, that's kind of like an understatement. So the, the angel of the Lord appeared, the glory of the Lord shone around him, uh, and the angel said to them, uh, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy which shall be for all the people. For today in the city of David, that's Bethlehem, uh, there has been born for you a what? A savior. Who is, uh, who, who's the savior? He's Christ, the Messiah, the Messiah, the anointed one. Well, who's that? He's the Lord. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I thought there was one God and one savior. Mm -hmm. And God's going to say in Revelation, let me, let me explain it further to you. And there's God the Father, and this is God the Son, the Messiah. This is his only begotten Son. Uh, and notice what you see here. You see the glory of the Lord uh, coming from the angel, because the angel is merely um, uh, radiating the brilliance of God in his presence. You know, like Moses, when he came down from the mount and his face shone, so they had to put a you know, piece of cloth over his face because he was emanating. So when you get to heaven, that's what's going to happen to you. You know, like those little glow things you would get at the fair as a kid, and you'd stick them under your lamp and... You know, you turn the light out and you just kind of stare at them, you know, until your parents tell you to, you know, cut the lights out. They are out, you know, uh, that's that you're absorbing the glory of God. So this angel absorbs the glory of God, radiates the glory of God. And then it also says that the glory of the Lord shone around them. So they saw the glory of the angel radiating God. And then they also see the glory of God, the Shekinah glory of God. So you can see that God, the father is in his dimension, showing his glory. The angel is there representing God and they're announcing the birth of Jesus the second member of the Trinity. And who do they call him? Well, they say that, well, he's the Lord. He's the Lord. He's the, uh, he's the God. So the question is, were the prophets in the Old Testament, uh, were, were, they, were they looking for the divine Lord to come? I mean, were they thinking about it? Sure. If they paid attention, they had plenty of evidence to know that the divine Lord is coming as the God-man. Uh, familiar text, uh, uh, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And it's good to go over familiar text because uh, sometimes you forget things, Correct. So if I see you wandering around in the parking lot looking for your car, illustration of my sermon. Yeah, because um, you forget things. So let's look at Micah chapter five, verse two. Uh, what did the prophet Micah say? He says, but as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathath, because I've told you there were two Bethlehems in Israel, one in the north, one in the south. He's very specific on which one this is concerning. Uh, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be the ruler of Israel, the great Davidic king. Um, how long has this coming ruler been around? Well, his goings forth are from long ago. Well, how long? From the days of eternity. So who, who did he just say was coming? Well, to the, if you study the context of uh, Micah chapter uh, 5 and really back up into chapter 4, uh, what you're seeing and as, as Judah is going to fall, it's prophesied that they're going to fall, but this is several hundred years before they fell. It's a very specific prophecy. And by the way, it's a side note. The reason why I'm a Christian is the power of specific prophecy. Because there's no way you even know what your stock is going to do by the end of this next week, correct? I mean, it's probably going to go down. <laughs> but who knows specifically? So God says, let me give you an amazing prophecy, 100 years before the fact that, that, that you're going to fall, the Babylonians are going to destroy you, uh, the last king is going to be Zedekiah, etc. And that whole prophecy in chapter 5 is about the fall of the kingdom uh, to the Babylonians in 586 BC, and Zedekiah is going to be the last king to sit on that throne of David. But in verse two, God gives his people hope because in wrath, God always remembers mercy. That's him. He remembers mercy. And he said, well, Israel, don't, don't worry. I am going to judge you for your sin. But one day one is coming. And when that one comes, he's, he's going to rule like no king has ever ruled. And let me tell you who he is. He's the eternal one. This is, see, this is God. This is why Isaiah, the contemporary of, uh, of Micah, can, can tell you in Isaiah 7, 14, his name will be Emmanuel, God with us. That Mike is just saying, oh yeah, he's the eternal one. Uh, he's coming to rule. So I don't know about you. Remember, we went back to Psalm 89. We talked about when uh, Watts wrote this song about how, how dismal the days were in Israel's period of the kings. Uh, and at the end of the Psalm, he looks for the coming of the Lord. Aren't you? I mean, aren't you sound real excited. Just get Pentecostal for just a moment. <laughs> 
Thank you. Aren't you excited that the Lord is coming? Yeah. Yeah, now if you're going, man, uh-oh, he just showed up. I'm not ready. Hopefully ready. Uh, but, you know, you should be excited about the Lord coming back. And so what he says here is, is well, it's not just the Lord like a man coming, but the, it's the Lord, the divine one. Uh, so in Micah chapter 5, I'll show you. Oh, I do have the Hebrew text up there, uh, except I don't have a pointer. Hmm, how am I going to do this? Uh, well, okay. <laughs> well, you see the last two words, because you read from the right to the left. So the last two words uh, are, are the word, uh, uh, you know, from, from like eternity. The last two words. Just take my word on it. They, they're the words that refer to the, that he's, that he's from the eternity. So some people say, well, that could be translated that the one that is coming is just from antiquity. Doesn't mean he's eternal. He's just from antiquity. And, and you can translate those last two words that way. But the only problem is, um, let's see, if you start over here on the right-hand side, the second word that starts with that, uh, it kind of looks like a round. You see the with a little tail on it? That's a meme. That's a preposition. But it, that particular word there, the second word means uh, that he is from eternity, from days long ago. So it totally tells you, it's not just a man who's coming. No, it's an eternal one that's coming Be, because he comes from eternity because this is how this is translated. Same word in, in Deuteronomy 33 when it talks about God because it uses the same word and translates it eternal. See, the eternal God, he's a dwelling place. See, only God lives outside of time and space. Only God is of time and space. Only God created time and space. Why? He's eternal. He's eternal. So if the Jews were paying attention, they should have been able to understand that the one who was coming to, re, to sit on the Davidic throne is the Lord himself, the divine one. Charles Feinberg, a great Hebrew scholar now with the Lord, a Jewish man who came to know Christ many years ago, taught Hebrew at Talbot Seminary years ago, said this about this verse. He says, the phrases of this text are the strongest possible statement of infinite duration in the Hebrew language. He says the pre-existence of the Messiah is being taught here, as well as his active participation in ancient times in the purposes of God. That's a whole nother sermon series of where do we see Jesus active in the Old Testament. It's a whole nother, we, maybe we could do that next Christmas. Okay, you sound excited, uh, maybe. But, uh, but the eternal Lord was coming to Bethlehem and anybody that was paying attention knew it. So if you look at Luke, Luke chapter two, uh, verses 10 to 11, the, well, the angel, the angel announced it. And so the shepherds then knew it. Uh, the religious leaders knew that the Messiah was coming, the, the Lord, uh, because in Matthew chapter two, as we saw last week in verses four to six, when Herod wants to know, where is this king coming? They all knew. Well, it, it says in Micah chapter five, verse two, they quoted it. Um, John the Baptist knew that the Lord was coming. Uh, Matthew chapter three, it says this. Uh, For this is the, the one, John the Baptist says, uh, that is referred to by Isaiah the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord. Uh, make his path straight. Uh, John the Baptist knew. When he saw Jesus, he said, I am the forerunner of the Messiah. I'm merely here to point to him. And who is he? Well, he's the Lord. He's the Lord. Uh, the devil knew that the Lord was coming. Because when you look at uh, Christ uh, dealing with the devil in, in uh, Matthew chapter four in the Judean wilderness in his temptation, when the devil is tempting him, Jesus is responding to him by quoting from the book of uh, Deuteronomy to rebuke, rebuke the devil by telling him that it, is, that it is sinful to tempt the Lord. Jesus knew who he was. Uh, I'm not done. Peter knew. Peter knew who it was. Second Peter chapter one, Peter, uh, the former fisherman who... Uh, got turned on to Christ as the Lord, said in verse 16, for we did not, uh, we did not as disciples follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord, Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He said, we saw his majesty. When did Peter see the majesty of Christ? That's a trivia question. Transfiguration, Mount Transfiguration. Imagine you're with Jesus on the, on the mount, maybe Mount Tabor in the Jezreel Valley, maybe. And they're on top of this, you know, volcanic cone of a mountain. And all of a sudden, Jesus steps apart from his, his physical body, and you can see his Shekinah glory. And what did Peter do? Uh, Peter immediately falls down and begins worshiping. They knew exactly who he was. He was the Lord. He wasn't just a man. He was the God man. Thomas got the memo eventually, didn't he? Uh, Thomas, we read uh, in the book of John, chapter 20, uh, after the resurrection, uh, Jesus, uh, you know, is going to appear to him. Uh, and when he finally encounters the risen Christ, because he had his questions, he was the doubting Thomas, uh, is, we read in verse 27 of John 20, then he said to Thomas, when he runs into Thomas, 
Hey, Thomas, reach your finger here and see my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving, but believing. I mean, if, Thomas, if you need proof that I am risen, here, just come t- touch the nail, you know, the scars. I mean, what did, what did Thomas do? Did he touch? No, he made a statement. Uh, he bowed in worship before him and said, my Lord and my God. This is why I'm not Jehovah's Witness. Why? Because they don't believe Jesus is Jehovah God. What did Jesus just say? He said, through the, through the mouth, uh, who, what did Thomas say? He, he, you are my Lord, the divine one, and you are Theos, Jehovah God. You are God. So they knew. Isaac Watts knew who was coming. That's why he wrote with great joy that this was the Lord uh, that came. So think about it. One man, Adam, who was finite, uh, threw us all into sin by his one misdeed, his one sin. Right? So a sin against an infinite God by a finite man, by definition, calls for one who's infinite to solve the problem. Who's the infinite one? Well, by definition, it could only be God who came as the Lord. So no wonder he says you, need, you have a decision if you understand who the Lord is, as he says in his song, Isaac Watts. If you understand that Jesus is the Lord, then let the earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. Let's uh, take those, um, you, you have a name, correct? It's not a hard question. Do you have a name? Yeah. So let's just drop the word earth out of there and the word heart out of there. Uh, and, and we're going to read this all together. And you're just going to put your name in there, okay, when I tell you to. You ready? It's not hard. You can do it. Okay, so you're going to put your name in there. So let's do it. Let Marty receive her king. Let every Marty in the room prepare room for him, right? I mean, prepare room for him. Let every heart prepare. Let my heart prepare. That's the, that's the joy of the, of the Christmas season because when you come to know Christ as Lord, if you are depressed, come talk to me because once you come to know Christ, the Lord, it's all about joy because now things are right in your life. Let earth receive her king. Uh, Paul, Paul writing uh, in Romans, in chapters nine through 11, he's speaking specifically to Jews. Uh, and in the smack dab in the middle of his address to Jews and the, and the whole concept of ju- justification by faith, how it applies to the, to the Jewish nation, God's first called people, Paul drops this in for Jewish people, primarily. He says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as who? Lord. And you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you might be saved. No, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him, you're not going to be disappointed. He's telling that to a Jewish person. For, because for a Jewish, it is, applies to a Gentile, but, but it's, it starts with them. For them to say, that Jesus is Lord is to say he's the divine one. So to say he's the one who, who came to earth, died and rose again, you're, you're claiming his deity status. And, and Paul says, when you do that, you'll not be disappointed because the moment you do that, it results in your salvation. You ever done that? That's the question. Because remember, a finite man plunged us into sin. It took an infinite man to get us out of sin. And who better than the Lord? Because only the Lord has the power to deal with the devil and with sin. I'm glad he came. Now you can see why I only covered three of these points in this passage. Point two, why should you be happy at Christmas? Well, because Jesus is the Savior. It's pretty simple. Joy to the world, the Savior does what? Reigns, past, present, or future. Past, present, the verb. It's a verb. Uh, The Savior reigns, past, present, or future tense. It's a present tense because he always reigns. Does he, Jesus, is there a day where he does not reign? No, he always reigns. He reigns as the Savior. Joy to the world. Let men their songs employ uh, while fields and uh, floods, rock hills and plains repeat the sounding joy. I mean, first, uh, Isaac Watts educates us regarding the joy that's wedded to the fact that Jesus reigns. As, as not just the Lord, not just as the king, but, but he reigns as the Savior. Hebrews 10, verse 12 says this about his work. It says, but he, Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down where? Right hand of God the Father, second member of the Trinity, sat down, waiting for that time onward until his enemies be made his footstool for his feet when he comes back to rule and reign. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. He, he sat down, he sat down, so that when you come to him and confess him as Lord, 
You know, he doesn't have to say, well, I, uh, you're kind of saved. No, he says, you're saved because I sat down. My work is complete. You are saved. Are you saved? He's the savior. He's not a savior. He's the savior. And he sat down like no priest ever sat down inside the temple of the holy place and the holy of holies. No, they never sat down because their work was never done. Jesus, the high priest, was the only one to sit down. Why? Because his, his work to redeem us and save us was finished. So that when you come to him and confess him, he does what he does. He saves you because that's what the song tells you. Joy to the world. Why? The Savior reigns. He reigns. Isaiah chapter 43, the prophet says, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I've chosen in order that you may know and believe in me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed and there were none after me. I, even I, am the Lord and there's no Savior besides me. That's God in the Old Testament, the Lord in the Old Testament. He's saying, I am the Savior. And now along, Jesus is coming along and saying, well, I'm, I'm the Savior. Well, who's God? Or, or who's Jesus? He's God the Savior. He's, he's the second member of the Trinity. Uh, it says in Isaiah 45, uh, amazing prophecy. Uh, and, and if you read chapter 45, 150 years before Cyrus, king of Persia, is born, 150 years, God prophesies by name that he will deliver Israel from a Babylonian bondage. 150 years prior to the fact. And later on down in that, that uh, passage in chapter 45, God says this, declare and set forth your case. Indeed, let them consult together. Who has announced this from old? Who has long since declared it? Is it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, uh, a righteous God and a savior. There is none except me. See, God says, you, you wanna know why I'm God? I am outside of time and space and can see all time as, as it exists like now. He says, I know who's going to come deliver Israel uh, from captivity. His name's Cyrus. And I'm going to give you his name by the prophet Isaiah, hundreds of years before the man's ever been born. And, and when he's born, you'll understand that my book is the, is the book. Is, why is this book different than all other holy books? Well, it's validated by the prophetic value of it. That shows you only God could know those things. And God says, L let me tell you who I am. Uh, I am the true God who can with specificity tell you what's gonna happen in human history, especially as it pertains to my people, Israel. I'm gonna send a Persian king who is not even on the planet yet, either, neither is his country, he's gonna deliver you. And God says, by the way, remember that I'm a savior and there's no other savior other than me. So when Jesus comes along, Jesus picks up the same name, savior, because they named him Jesus, which means Jesus, which is from the Hebrew Yeshua, which is from the verb Yasha, which means to save and redeem. Uh, when I go to Israel, I always take people uh, to um, where Elizabeth uh, and uh, Mary met, and Elizabeth was pregnant. And I always take everybody, there's a beautiful little uh, chapel there, it's overlooking a valley down below where John the ba Baptist grew up. Elizabeth, you know, the mother of John the Baptist, and related, we don't know exactly how to Mary, it says they were related, but we don't know exactly how, but Elizabeth and Mary get together and, and Mary, Mary has just been told by the angel that she's going to be the mother of the Messiah. And so she, she meets with Elizabeth, uh, her relative, and she's pregnant with uh, John. And when they meet and, and Mary announces that, that the angel has just revealed to me, I'm going to be the mother of the Messiah. John, inside the womb, does what? He starts going nuts, doesn't he? He's jumping all around. Uh, as a side note, this is, a, this, is, this is another reason I'm pro-life. Why? Because John, he knew that that was the Messiah's mom. Isn't it amazing? He wasn't a blob. He was a handcrafted baby that was the forerunner of the Messiah. He, he goes crazy in the womb. And in Luke chapter 1, uh, Mary then turns and says, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. She knew that God the Savior had chosen her to be the mother of the Savior, God who would be born to redeem us from our sins. Why? Because she was told to name him Yeshua, which is Savior. Luke chapter two says, the angels said to the, the shepherds, don't be afraid as we read earlier, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which for all people, for today in the city of David, there's been born for you a Savior. Who is it? Well, it's Christos, Christ. And who is he? He's, he's the Lord. He's the Lord God. Why did he come? Remember I told you? sin against an infinite God by a finite man, by definition calls for an infinite man, God to come to handle the issue. Aren't you glad he came? Because he's the Lord and he's the savior. 
Colossians chapter 1 says, For he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. If you're a Christian, that applies to you. That moment of confessional faith, he then delivered you from the domain of darkness and put you in his kingdom of light. Titus 3 tells you about the work of Christ this way. It says, But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of our deeds, which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration, by the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Christ Jesus our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You didn't save yourself, right? When you saw your sin and turned to him as Savior, he saved you and he poured his love, as it says there, he poured his love all over you, not because of your deeds, but because of his deed. Remember, Sin against an infinite God by a finite man calls for an infinite Savior. That was Jesus. So what should be your response to who Jesus is as the Savior? Well, the rest of the song tells you. Let men their songs employ. When, while fields and rocks and hills and plains repeat the sounding joy, there should be a cosmic happening when you understand who Jesus is. He says in verse three, no more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. When you look at Jesus, who he is as the Lord and as the Savior, and you understand who he is, you, then you understand that he's going to come and reverse the curse. No more weeds in your yard. No more spotted spurge. No more milkweeds. No more purslane. No more crabgrass. No more weeds. No more disease. No more fungi. No, no, no deterioration of the cosmos. He's going to reverse all of that. He's going to bring back paradise. That's so in Romans 8. Romans 8 says, uh, for the anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it, but in hope, that the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption uh, into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation does what? Groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. But what's what's the old earth looking for? Well, for the Savior to come, for the Lord to come, because they know when he comes, he reverses the curse and brings paradise here. Everything around here deteriorates and falls apart, doesn't it? Isn't it? It's true. Even my new car, I was waxing it the other day. Little rust spots in here and there. It's from the devil. It's sin. (laughs) It's just, I'm like, it's the law of entropy or whatever it is. It's everywhere, is it not? I mean, you can't get away from it. But, but you know, everything's passing away on this old earth, but not my faith and not my Savior. So you should be joyous this Christmas and sell your, not sell your joy, <laughs> freely give away your joy of who the Jesus is and share with people who he is because it is joyous news for old sin tattered earth because the king has been born. Let's pray. God, thank you for the joy that we can have as Christians. Uh, and may our lives look like joy, uh, exude joy. Uh, May there be something so qualitatively different about us this Christmas season that those who don't know you are actually going to come up and ask us, hey, uh, what are you so excited about? And we'll have the words to tell them from this old song in Jesus' name. Amen. Merry Christmas. God bless you.